Good day, Grade Tools. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. Um, if you haven't joined us before, I'd like to encourage you, and even if you have joined us before, I'd like to encourage you to join our Grade 12 physical science class. Um, it was pointed out to me that some of you might not know the benefits and might not know why I want you to join or how to join the physical science class. So I'm going to show you. Um, basically, the way you do this is you choose your input browser. So I use Firefox. I'm going to click on Firefox. But it doesn't matter if you use Google Chrome or any other type of internet um, browser. Okay, and you're going to type in to enable.org. Uh, you get to get to this website. Actually, you won't. You'll get to a page where you have to sign in. You can get to a page that's going to say, um, please sign in. In fact, here you go. Let me show you. Let's just log out. And you'll get to the landing page. And then what you need to do is you need to register if it's the first time. I am not a first time user, so I'm just going to log in. Um, the nice thing is it does remember you. And then you're going to get to a dashboard. And the dashboard's going to have on the left hand side will be some things like year average, etc., etc. And then it says dashboard, upcoming events, revision, live assessments, messaging. Okay. Now, in order to make full use of this stuff on the left hand side, you need to use this stuff. Okay. Now, don't worry about the My Classrooms and Administration. That's not for you guys. You need to worry about this block here. And under it will say curriculum, learner and teacher resources, and there'll be a choose subject, progress and results, to enable a help online. And then these are the subjects that I've already joined. So what you do is you press the red button, which is to choose a subject. And then you will see a whole bunch of subjects that to enable actually offers on their platform. At the moment, we only do live lessons for maths and physical sciences, um, but you can join any of the other subjects and you can go in and get all the information and help. Let me just show you. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually go into physical science and we're going to choose grade 12 and you're going to enroll. OK, and it says you are now registered for physical science grade 12. OK, awesome. Okay, so then what you will see is it will say, yeah, physical science grade 12, you'll get a block and that will be your classroom that you have joined. Okay, if you go click on that, just to let you know, this is what this, um, enable platform originally had. You'll get all the weeks with all the different sections that are covered. And on top of that, there'll be videos in here, there'll be assessments, etc., etc., etc. If, however, you don't want to use that and you just want to use the lessons that we're offering, which is awesome, then you need to worry about these things over here. Now, the reason that I would like you to join the class is, first of all, it's pretty um, anonymous. I don't know who you are, okay? You can use any name. But the point is that what I would like to do and which I think is the ideal way to use this platform is for it to be a bit more interactive. So. The idea would be that I would be able to give you after doing a section. So let's say I teach you the reactions of organic chemistry, okay, organic chemical reactions. So then I could give you what is called a live assessment. So you would see a big little circle, well, a circle here that says one. And on it will be an alive assessment and it'll look something like this. You will see in the revision section that I've given one for the grade 11 maths and the grade 10 maths. OK, so but anyway, there'll be a live assessment and it'll be a multiple choice questions. And the idea with this is that you would basically be able to answer those questions and I would give you a couple of days to do it obviously and I don't see your specific results I don't see that Johnny did or Ingrid or whomever did a certain marks or whatever what it does give you though is that if 50 people answered the assessment and let's say 10 people didn't get question three right okay then i will see a graph of the results and i'll go oh dear 10 people didn't get question three right 
I'm going to now go and look at question three and see what that is on and then address it in the next lesson. So I can make sure that you guys all understand all the work that we're doing. Okay, so it's supposed to be a problem solving initiative. It's not supposed to be just me teaching you guys. The other reason why you'd want to join it is because, there are two other reasons. One is because then you can message me and I'll show you how you can do that in a minute. Um, and the other reason is because then you get a list of the upcoming events. So if you go click on upcoming events, obviously I'm registered in all the classes because I teach them. So I get all these, okay? And you guys, when you want to register for them, when you see this, you can put view event, okay? And that will actually get you to the lesson. And we're gonna do that in a second, but I just wanna show you something else. If you press July, okay, 2016, for example, what will happen is you will see all the old events. Okay, these are all the old lessons that happened in July. Okay, and you can see that there are a whole bunch of grade 12 physical science. In fact, they were basically every day of the week from the 18th of July. So if you've missed a lesson or say, for example, I'm teaching you something today on organic chemistry and I carry on from yesterday and you're like, what is she talking about? I missed that first bit. You can go and look at yesterday's lesson or or if you want, if you're watching the lesson today and you don't quite understand something I've said, then you can actually go and watch it again. Okay. But let's go and see what you would do if you wanted to watch today's lesson. So there it is, Thursday, 18th of August, and it is from 6 to 6.45, and it's online, we view the event. So that gives you the information. It tells us the organization, da 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 da, we don't really care. If you press OK, this window goes away. But yeah, we're going to press Open Live TV link, okay? And you will get this page, okay? Now, you get two buttons. The one is join the event and the other one is sign in as event team member. You are not an event team member. I'm an event team member. My boss and the rest of his team are event team members. You are a guest watching the video. Okay, so you join the event. So when you join the event, you're going to see the video coming up and there is a little bit of a lag. So when this comes up and you'll hear it in the background on my sound, it'll actually, oh, I've switched the sound down. Hang on, let me show you. Um, I switched the sound down. I'm not an event team member. I'm an event team member. My boss. Okay, so there you go. You get the gist. Okay, so then you can watch the video, right? Awesome. And you can even pause the video. How cool is that? Okay, but now we can actually message the studio. So you can message me and you can say, hey, I really don't understand rates of reactions. Okay, please can you go through activation energies and rates of reactions and catalysts. Okay, and then I can make a plan to do lessons according to those sections. So that's the whole idea. The idea is that we work on this together and I feed into the problem areas. Okay, so I can see that there are quite a few people watching these videos, but we don't have a huge number of people actually joining the classes yet. And I think the main reason is because it's quite tricky to get there and also you might not see the benefit. Okay, so there you go. So I would really like to encourage you to join the classes. Okay, you're welcome to do it at any stage. Okay, so now I want to carry on with today's lesson. So let's get going. We were doing organic chemistry, we're still doing organic chemistry. And as I said to you yesterday, at the moment, all we're doing is going through the different categories, the different homologous series. And so far, we have covered alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, okay, so those are hydrocarbons. We've colored halo alkanes or alkyl halides. Okay, and we are now doing our aldehydes, sorry, alcohols, and now we're doing our aldehydes and ketones. And yesterday we covered the fact that the functional group of the aldehyde and ketone is the carbonyl, which is C double bonded O. Okay, and if it's at the end of a chain, 
Okay, then it is an aldehyde. And remember I said to you that the way I remember this is end and hide both have Ds. So therefore it is an aldehyde. Whereas if my C double bonded O was in the middle of my chain, then it would be a ketone. Okay, so now we're carrying on with it and we're now going to talk about the uses of aldehydes. So one of the main uses of aldehydes is in resins and it says over 16 million tons of formaldehyde are produced per year. So what is formaldehyde? Formaldehyde is actually a very toxic solution and what I have included here is basically a human brain that has been kept in formaldehyde and what it does is it basically keeps this brain in its own it keeps it it preserves it it keeps it in its own, the way it should be so this brain might be 80 years old and because it's been kept in formaldehyde um, then it preserves it in fact formaldehyde is also used in a lot of people when they get buried their bodies are pumped through with formaldehyde to keep the so to preserve the body. So that is one of the uses of aldehydes. It's also used in the production of plasticizers and alcohols used in detergents. So basically they use it to form your, to, together with your alcohols in detergents. It's also used in perfumes and flavorants. So it's got quite a few uses. Now we're gonna talk about carboxylic acids. Now, the, don't want you to get confused between the carboxyl group and the carbonyl group. The carbonyl group is a C double bonded O. The carboxyl group is a C double bonded OH, okay? So, C double bonded OOH. C double bonded OOH. Okay, now, another thing you need to know, and I've mentioned this yesterday, is that whenever you draw OH, you will not write it as C dash OH because that is incorrect. They do not recognize it. And if you write it out like that, you will get it wrong. Okay, they do not accept this. I mean, accept that. You have to show all the bonds. The name of a carboxylic acid ends in oic acid. So it would be methane, oic acid, ethane, oic acid. Okay, so the general formula is CN, H2, N plus one, C, double O, H. I'm giving you this, we're not generally asked about the general formula of the carboxylic acids, but I'm just giving it to you so that you can recognize it. But the most important thing is if you see this Q, then you know that it is a, a carboxylic acid. So let's just quickly talk about these two. You can see here that this has got one carbon. Yeah, is your functional group of C double bonded OOH. So this is called methanoic acid. This here has got two carbons in its main chain and yeah is your double bonded OOH. So this is going to be called ethanoic acid. Okay, so the methane stays the same, the ethane stays the same, but then we add oic acid in place of it. And when you guys draw it out, you don't have to put the hydrogen at an angle. You can if you want, but it's not a big deal. So for example, if you had to draw propanoic acid, it would be carbon, 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 double bonded O, OH would be fine. And then you'd need to draw your hydrogens on and don't forget to put your hydrogens on. And then always count one, two, three, four. Okay, nothing else in that carbon. Okay, so don't forget to put your hydrogens on because that is also a common error. Okay, so uses of carboxylic acids. First of all, it's widespread in nature. Methanoic acid, which is also known as formic acid. Formic acid is the old name for methanoic acid. So if you're speaking to someone who's been doing science for quite a while, or if you're reading a little bit of an older textbook, you might see the words formic acid. And it's found in insect stings. And I've included a picture of a red ant. If you guys have ever sat and red ant and it's bitten you and it stings painfully, that 
is pure methanoic acid, concentrated methanoic acid that it is injecting into your body as it stings you, which is why it hurts so much, okay? So that is why, and what do they do with that, that, that acid? They actually use it to numb they prey, okay, the prey is usually a lot smaller than us, and that sting actually numbs their prey. Ethanoic acid is also known as acetic acid, and it's the main component of vinegar. Admittedly, it's a dilute, it's a very dilute form. Dilute, I think it's only 5%, but the dilute form of um, ethanoic acid. I'm pretty sure it's only 5%. But the point is, if you want to know what ethanoic acid tastes like, it tastes like vinegar. Okay, please go, go around tasting ethanoic acid. Okay. Right, so let's talk about the production of ethanoic acid. Ethanol, okay, is your alcohol. But when it's exposed to air, it becomes an oic acid, a carboxylic acid. And I guarantee you that somewhere along the line, well, actually not necessarily, but some of you may have experienced this. Let's say, for example, um, you or parents have a dinner party and there are some glasses of wine left out from the night before and the next day you're helping them clear up and you might smell the glass of wine and this might smell a bit acidic, okay? And if you had to taste it, which I'm really hoping you wouldn't do, but if you had to taste it, it would actually taste a bit of vinegary, okay? Or sometimes if you're buying a a bottle of wine, especially the older types of wine, they might say to you, ooh, it's corked, okay? And what they mean by that is that the cork on the bottle of wine has actually disintegrated and two things have happened. One is the cork has got into the wine, the pieces of cork got into the wine, which has obviously changed the taste, but more importantly, air has got into the wine. And the oxygen in the air has got into the wine, which means that the alcohol has reacted with the oxygen in the air to form ethanoic acid and water. And that's how we get our ethanoic acid. You take your ethanol, you react it with oxygen, it'll form ethanoic acid and water. So you get a, a very diluted form of vinegar. Okay, ethanoic acid. Now let's talk about esters. When an alcohol reacts with a carboxylic acid, an ester is formed. Okay, when an alcohol reacts with a carboxylic acid, an ester is formed, and it's one of the more important of the reactions. Now, it has a very characteristic smell. They're very sweet, they're very fruity type of smells. And the, there is a byproduct, and the byproduct is water, which is why this process is either called a condensation reaction, condensation, or it's called esterification, esterification. Okay, so esterification is obviously the making of esters and it's called a condensation reaction gives, because it gives of water. And you guys by now will have definitely done your plastics and polymers and you'll know that there are two types of reactions that can make plastics and polymers and I will go through it later. But the one is an addition reaction, the other one is a condensation reaction. And the condensation reaction is basically the addition of esters to make polymers esters. So that's where that name comes from, from the condensation reaction of these esters. Right, in order for this to happen, you need a catalyst. And the catalyst that is used is sulfuric acid. Now you guys have to be careful because although the sulfuric acid is a catalyst, if the teachers ask you in the exams, what does the role of sulfuric acid play, you need to say two things. One, is that it acts as a catalyst and two, that it acts as a dehydrating agent. Because if you take, I don't know if you guys know this, but if you take water and you add sulfuric acid to it, it has a very violent reaction, which is why if you're doing this, you actually need to take a glass rod and let's say this is your water and you pour the sulfuric acid along the glass rod into the water and the reason you do that is because then you don't have a backsplash and the problem is that it has a lot of heat it has a very violent reaction it gets very very hot and that is because sulfuric acid is a dehydrating 
agent. I don't know if you guys have been shown this, but if you take pure sugar, um, white sugar, and you add sulfuric acid to it, H2SO4, it comes out in this horrible big black carbon mass. And the reason for that is that sugar is made up of C6H12O6. And when you add sulfuric acid to it, it takes away all the water and you're just left with a mass of sulfuric acid and carbon. And it's horrible and it's black and it smells. And the reason it smells is because it's that burnt smell. Okay, so if you haven't seen that reaction, either message me and I'll show you a video of it or go Google it, sugar and sulfuric acid, or ask your teachers. Okay, so sulfuric acid acts as a dehydrating agent, which means it takes away its water out of it. Okay, and that's actually how the reaction works. So I'll talk about the general formula. For example, you've got methanol and ethanoic acid. So let me just show you this and then we'll talk about the general formula. Methanol is one carbon and alcohol. So it's going to be C, O, H, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Okay. Ethanoic acid is two carbons and it's got that carboxyl group. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it on this side. So I'm going to go C, double bonded O, OH, okay, and then it's one, two, three, four, C, H, H, H. Now what happens is this is added together in the presence of sulfuric acid. And what sulfuric acid does is it takes the, I don't know what color to use this one, we're going to take the whole of that hydroxyl group off the methanol, and we're going to take the hydrogen off the oic acid, the ethanoic acid, and we end up with water. We end up with water, okay? And then this thing joins together because he has a free arm and he has a free arm. So they join together and it becomes, and I'm going to write it up here because no space, it's a C, H, H, H. That's this bit here. Actually, in fact, you know what? I should be doing this in red. So let me just hang on. Let me just make it easier for you guys to understand. So what happens is this should be C, H, 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 and that's that little free arm there, right? And then we take this blue that I shouldn't be writing with. Um, hang on. And I go dash, oh, it's a different blue, never mind. O dash C dash C double bonded O, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Okay, now obviously you don't need to show that these belong to both of this, okay? Because this is really just unpaired, unpaired electrons that become paired to join that on. Okay, but do you see that this is now your ester? And what has happened is the name now becomes methanol, because it lost its whole hydroxyl group, becomes methyl, okay? And ethanoic acid becomes Ether noate. And the reason it's called enoate is because it ends in that double bonded OO. Okay. Because it ends in a Q without the H, it's an O8. Okay. So that's how your ester is formed. Let's draw another one. I'm going to try and draw it a bit neater this time. So let's go with ethanol. Ethanol is going to be carbon, carbon, hydroxyl, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen hydrogen, hydrogen, then you go plus, we've got propanoic acid, now propan is three, three carbons, so it's going to be C double bonded O, O, H, one, two, three, and then two, three, that's a hydrogen, 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 okay. The whole of this hydroxyl group is stolen from the alcohol or removed and the hydrogen is removed from there and this forms water and why? Because we have the presence of sulfuric acid and we end up with C dash C hydrogen hydrogen 
hydrogen, 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 and then three doesn't matter. O C double bonded O C C hydrogen 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 and let's talk about naming this the ethanol becomes an e thiol because it's lost its whole hydroxyl group and the propanoic acid becomes propanoate okay now grade 12s you don't really need to know which of these has lost the hydroxyl group and which is not the lost the hydrogen, as long as you know that water is out and that the oxygen is joining the two. The reason I stress it is because the reason this becomes an ethyl group is because this year is a C, it would be an ethane. Do you agree that if I head this away, I can't show you how to do that. If I head this away, if I just looked at the red, hang on, wait a minute, wait, if I did this. If I just look at this bit here, without knowing that the rest of it was the joining up of an ester. Do you agree that if I looked at that, I would say, oh, well, that's obviously an ethyl group because it would be ethane, except it's got a free arm. So therefore it's an ethyl. That's how I know that the hydroxyl group's been stolen from the ethanol, okay, well, been removed from the ethanol, okay? So, and then you've got the propanoate, which has got the double bonded OO, which is why it gives me that O8 name there. Okay, so that, but you don't need to know that, you just need to make sure that you draw it out all perfectly. And then you need to also know that this thing here, the C double bonded OO, this here is the functional group, the functional group of an ester. Okay, and you may already have heard of it. If you haven't already, you should have. It's called an ester linkage. Ester linkage. It what what makes the ester? It's an ester linkage. Okay, so if we go up a little bit, you can see that the general formula of this is CnH2NO2. Again, we're not really going to test you on that. I'm just letting you know what the general formula is, so you can recognize it if you need to. Okay, so now let's talk about the common uses of esters. Firstly, it's used in cosmetics and beauty products. You need to understand that esters are very sweet smelling compounds, okay? You can get pineapple smell and banana flavor and everything else. They've got very fruity smells. So most of the smells that you get in your, your juice, juices and everything else. So if, for example, you're drinking a yogi sip and it smells of granadella, there's a very strong possibility that if that it's got fake granadella in it, okay, and if you look in the ingredients, you'll see an O8 in it. And that means that they've got an ester in it that has is making, pretending to have the smell of a granadilla. Okay. They make good artificial flavorants and scents. They're also used in nail varnish remover, especially the nice smelling ones. Model plain glue. So you guys should recognize the smell now if you get an idea. And they use as plasticizers because esters make a compound less brittle or more flexible. So they add it into compounds to make them more, um, more flexible. Right, so now that we've spoken about all the different types of organic compounds that you guys need to know about this year, we now need to talk about physical properties and intermolecular forces because that is what actually, the intermolecular forces is what actually influences the physical properties of the different organic compounds. Okay, so now first of all, let's talk about physical properties. What are physical properties? So the phase, in other words, are they liquid at room temperature? Are they gas at room temperature? Are they solid at room temperature? And we only talk about those three phases. I know there's a plasma phase, but it hasn't hit our curriculum yet, so you don't have to worry about that. So the phases are physical properties. Their melting points, the temperature at which they go from a solid to a liquid, or their boiling points from a liquid to a gas, are dependent on the intermolecular forces and they are physical properties. Think about this way, the chemical properties are how they react in chemical reactions and their physical properties are how they look and how they behave by themselves. That might help you. So now, these are all ruled by the intermolecular forces. 
Now, intermolecular forces, as the name implies, are forces that act between the molecules, not within the molecules. Within the molecules, you're talking about covalent. We normally be talking about covalent bonding, ionic bonding, metallic bonding. That is intramolecular forces. Intramolecular forces, intramolecular forces are within the molecule. And we're talking about covalent ionic and metallic that's intra now we are not talking about intra we're talking about intermolecular and here's another hint it's usually intramolecular bonds and intermolecular forces because the intermolecular forces are way weaker than the intramolecular bonding now within organic chemistry we generally just have covalent bonding so you can ignore that but we are now going to talk about intermolecular forces and guys this is very important section in organic chemistry they love asking about this so we're going to get through it and make sure you understand it and the first thing we're going to do is go through the types of intermolecular forces that you get now some of this might be a bit of overkill for you guys and that's fine um, some of you may feel that you know it already, that's fine too, but it's very important that you know the differences. Let's go through it. First of all, there are dipole-dipole forces. So a dipole is a molecule that has got one side that is slightly positive and the other side is slightly negative. So what you're looking at is a covalent molecule that is slightly, or polar covalent molecule that is slightly positive on one end and slightly negative. So another example other than this random drawing is, and just by the way, this D, in case you don't know, this little squiggle, okay is actually okay you guys know about a big d which is a delta and that is capital d in greek okay and that stands for delta or change in now the small version of this so this would be our capital d right and you know how we write little d like this in greek the little d looks like that see like that and this means very small change so what they're saying is that this end is very slightly positive and this side is very slightly negative, okay? But not neutral overall. Okay, so another example of this would be, for example, the water molecule. So your water molecule is polar covalent. You've got the oxygen here and you've got the hydrogen here and the hydrogen here. And the hydrogen atoms are gonna be very slightly positive and your oxygen atom is going to be very slightly negative. So if I was another atom and I was coming along this way, do, 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 I would even though the whole of this molecule, the water molecule is neutral, the whole of it's neutral. If I was a teeny, teeny atom and I was coming this way, I would see the water molecule as slightly negative. But if I was coming this way, I would see the water molecule as slightly positive. And that's the whole point. In fact, if I was coming this way, I would see it as slightly positive because because of both of these playing together. So that's the whole point about a dipole. It's a molecule that is one end is slightly positive and the other is slightly negative. Okay. So dipole-dipole forces occur when one dipole force comes near or in contact with another dipole molecule. So we're showing here attraction because what has happened is that this dipole has got close to this dipole and it happens to be that as they're moving around, this slightly negative end side, negative side happens to be facing the slightly positive side, okay? So we get a force of attraction. But we could also get a force of repulsion because what could have happened is we could have had slightly negative, slightly positive, and then we could have had slightly positive, slightly negative. Because remember these things are three-dimensional and they're spinning around and bouncing all over the show because of random Brownian motion. So if you have these to come close together, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have a force of repulsion repulsion they're going to be pushed away from each other whereas if you've got slightly negative and slightly positive you've got a force of attraction so an example is the positive one end of the molecule will be attracted to the negative end of the other molecule so that is dipole dipole forces they are very weak forces very weak they don't allow the molecules can, to actually stick together all that they do is with the attraction is it allows the molecules to move close together than they would normally do which actually allows them to freeze or um, 
basically allows them to settle in lower energy states much sooner. So in other words, the, the melting point is going to be lower. Okay, do you understand? The temperature to which they're going to solid will actually be higher, shall I say. Then you have hydrogen bonding. Anyone have I missed? Oh, yes, sorry. Hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding is a very special case of a dipole-dipole bonding. So, I've already drawn a water molecule before where there was an oxygen and here we are two hydrogens. And I said that this is slightly positive, I mean slightly negative, and this is slightly positive, and this is slightly positive, as they show here. Okay? But now, Hydrogen bonding is a bit more different than dipole dipole because it's stronger. Okay, in fact, hydrogen bonding is your strongest intermolecular force, and I know it's called bonding. Okay, but the only reason it's called it's a misnomer, it's still a force because bonding implies that these molecules will actually change and become one when they don't. But what does happen is that these molecules can actually be held near each other in a specific position because of these forces. So hydrogen bonding is a misnomer, it should be called a force, but never mind, it's now called a bond. So this type of bonding occurs between, and listen, you need to learn this because they like to ask it. This is between a hydrogen atom covalently bonded to a small, highly electronegative atom. And the only ones you guys need to worry about are fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. So that's fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. And the cool thing is, is that you don't have, okay, fluorine admittedly is in your halo alkanes, but you guys don't have to worry about amides and amines, so you don't have to worry about nitrogen in organic chemistry. Okay, so as far as you're concerned, you only need to worry about, as far as you're concerned with organic chemistry, you only have to worry about if there's a hydroxyl group, okay, and that is only time. So for you guys, your hydrogen bonding is going to occur in your alcohols and in your carboxylic acids. That's the only time you guys are going to have to worry about hydrogen bonding, which means that your alcohols and carboxylic acids are going to have stronger intermolecular forces than all the other types of molecules, organic molecules that we're studying. Okay, so alcohols and carboxylic acids when they're the strongest. And if you need to know which of the strongest of these two carboxylic acids win, if it's the same size, in other words, the same length chain. In other words, if I'm comparing ethanol with ethanoic acid, ethanoic acid has the strongest bonds overall. Okay, but we'll talk about that later. But the point is that this, these are the only two groups that have hydrogen bonding in and therefore they have got the strongest intermolecular forces. So definition of hydrogen bonding is the type of bonding occurs when a molecule containing a hydrogen atom covalently bond is occurs in an in a okay let's make it in a molecule when you've got a hydrogen atom covalently bonded to small highly electronegative atom and your examples are fun fluorine oxygen and nitrogen okay the highly electronegative atom is actually going to attract the hydrogen atom on a nearby molecule so what happens is is that this is your oxygen okay and here is your hydrogen and what is happening is that there is a force of attraction between the positively charged hydrogen and the negatively charged electron. Okay, so there you go. Your oxygen, which is the highly electronegative atom, is going to attract the hydrogen atom on the nearby molecule. This oxygen atom is attracting this hydrogen this oxygen atom attracting this hydrogen. So there is attraction between the molecules. 
Now let's talk about London forces. And this is the last force I'm going to talk about today because we're running out of time. London forces are important. Now listen to me, grade 12s. In the old curriculum, in your slightly older textbooks, you will see the words van der Waals forces. Now what you need to understand is that as far as you're actually concerned, you get two types of intermolecular forces. You get hydrogen bonding, And then you get van der Waals forces. Ugh. Van der Waals forces. And all these things, dipole induced, dipole, 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 iron, dipole, all of those fall under van der Waals forces, okay? But now they've said no. We're going to make it a little bit more complicated than that. You get van der Waals forces and then you get induced dipole forces, which we're going to call London forces. And London forces are the things that keep all the organic compounds together except for your alcohols and your carboxylic acids. So if it does not include an hydroxyl group, then the intermolecular forces that are holding it together are the London forces. I know if you look at all the exam papers, they are going to use the words van der Waals forces. So wherever you see a memo where they say the words van der Waals forces, you need to think London forces, okay? Because that's what is now suggested in the curriculum, okay? We no longer use van der Waals forces. As the rule, we use London forces. And what are London forces? London forces are very, very weak forces. They're saying that in non-polar molecules, the electronic charge is evenly distributed, but at one particular time, the electrons might be not be evenly distributed. So what we're saying is, I just want to see if I've got a picture. No, okay, right. So let's say, for example, you have got an atom. I mean, yeah, a molecule, atom, whatever. Let's say, yeah, it's your molecule. And yeah, it's your atom, okay? And you know that your electrons are rotating around in the orbitals. They're going round, not rotating. But they're going around. Okay. But now what happens is, what happens if this electron happens to be here at this point in time, and it's partner electron happens to be going around and it happens to be here. So what happens is that the whole of this might look slightly negative and the whole of the other side, this side, mm, green sounds the right color, um, 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 let's use black, the whole of this side might look slightly positive to a very small atom on the other side because both of these electrons are kind of on this side of the molecule. It's very brief because this electron is moving all the time. It's going yung, yung around again and again and again and again. And similarly with this one. So it's a very brief interval. But if, if at that time you have another atom whose electrons are also on the opposite side, then what's going to happen? This is going to be seem slightly positive and this side is going to seem slightly negative and you're going to get repulsion. Okay, or the other way can happen as well. But I'm going to carry on with this tomorrow um, because we've now run out of time. So please join me again tomorrow for this lesson for on organic chemistry and we'll carry on talking about the intermolecular forces and the properties of organic chemicals. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.